Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY, called Retreat Hall Chapter 10, written by a Lithy Dragon. This was not a good day. Michael surveyed the bodies laid out before him in the pavilion turned morgue. Three marines, none of them older than 23, and one a German shepherd. Are you sure that we didn't get any of the bastards? General Zawak asked. His uniform was barely ruffled, despite having spent the night in the wrong FOB on lockdown. No, sir, Lieutenant Colonel Mayhew said, shaking his head. He sleepless night and reflected in the slight bags under his eyes. There's a blood trail that leads over the berm and into the woods, and we've got a dog team backed up by half a platoon on it now, but no body so far. Not fast enough, Michaels resisted the urge to rub his own baggy eyes. Between the lockdown and the sweep of the base, the elves had enough of a head start. They probably go across the river and halfway up to Keeblerville by now. How did they get in? he asked. The Ganlin gave us those beacons to set up around the FOB to disrupt their invisibility. They did, but they didn't give us enough, Mayhew shook his head, not for how much we've had to expand the perimeter. Have they been shorting us? Sergeant Major Miller asked. Michael suppressed a frown. Miller always struck him as being too quick to throw the blame on someone that was appropriate, especially a regimental sergeant major. No, I don't think so, Mayhew shook his head. The reports of my men have given me say that they're struggling even with their own supplies that we've shared with them. He sighed rubbing the gunk out of his eyes. And the number of beacons I've seen set up around their own camp indicated that they don't have enough beacons left to cover themselves. So they slipped in through the cracks, Colonel Anders asked. Essentially, sir, yes. Sergeant Major Donald said, the broad-shouldered man resembled a bulldog. Michaels knew him by his reputation for being a tenacious and stubborn as one, but he looked just as tired as the commanding officer. The way they coat cat wizards explained it, the beacon's effectiveness starts to taper off at certain distances. At the edges, it's almost nothing, and a skilled Keebler wizard can keep their crap stable through it. So, we don't have enough overlap. Worse, sir, Donald said. We've got total gaps in coverage. Not all the beacons have been moved since initially set up, but we've identified some total gaps that you could drive on Abrams through, and the whole perimeter is scattered with weak areas. How many got in, and are there still inside? We're not entirely sure, Mayhew said, but between the reports, while well, little security camera coverage that we had in the area, and two GoPros, they're pretty certain that the team of eight. We did a thorough sweep of the base with the dogs, Donald said. He nodded to the slain shepherd. Sergeant Razor caught on them right quick, led her team straight to the bastards. Whatever they got, they can't block a dog's nose. Rochak nodded, and then sighed. Let's let these boys lie in peace. Michaels gave a silent nod to the fallen marines, paying final respects. They weren't his men. All the second battalion had been moved back to Tolkien, but they were still marines. Do we have any idea what their objectives were? Zarachak asked as they stepped out of the tent, followed closely by his aide and the rest of the party. Not so sure, sir, Mayu said. Nothing has been identified as missing, and they hadn't gotten very far into the camp before Razor led Corporal Ramirez and Goldberg right to them. We swept through the camp with anything that might be left behind, Donald said. They even got a couple of goat cat wizards to come over and scan for anything that might have deployed. Came up with nothing. They were probably doing recon, Michael said. That's what we figured too, Mayhew nodded. Well... Now we know that we're vulnerable, Miller said, and it's cost us three marines and a dog and five more injured to tell them that. The conversation was interrupted by a ringing of a cell phone. Tolkien was close enough to the portal to get a regular cell signal, and repeaters had been set up to provide signals inside the FOB Williams, though it was still spotty in some portions of the base. Zarachak's aide, a young lieutenant, pulled out the phone out of his pocket and answered it. After a brief conversation, his eyebrows shut up, and he held the phone out. Sir, you need to take this. Zarachak raised an eyebrow and took the phone. General Chowchak, sir? Crap. Aye, sir. Yes, sir. I concur, sir. Yes, sir. We can make that happen. No, sir. Will they need support? Aye, sir. I'll have units standing by just in case. Yes, sir. We'll get it locked down, sir. He hung up the phone, handing it back to his aide. Anders, get Marimar on the horn. Tell them to pull half the stockpile we raided from the elves and make it ready for immediate delivery. He turned to Mayhew. 
Send a message to the Kishman that we need more of those disruptor crap as ASAP. They can have as many mana crystals we liberated from the elves as they need to make them. We need a solid perimeter around Williams and Tolkien with no gaps. He turned back to his aid. Clemson, get on the horde with the MWD commanders and tell them we need continuous patrols around both perimeters. We need every dog that can be spared sent to the front for patrols, and we need them here yesterday. What happened? Michaels asked. He scowled. One of the bastards slipped through to Earth. Crap. How bad is it? Mayhew said. He murdered a family and was camping in the house. Country sheriffs were sent to check in on the family this morning, and he killed one of the deputies before getting away. Crap. Has it hit the media yet? Muller asked. Not yet, but they already are standing up at a statewide manhunt, and every three-letter agency between San Diego and D.C. is throwing the hat in the ring. It's not going to stay quiet for long. Freaking hell. Yeah, Zarucek shook his head. We need to get on top of this cluster, Freck. This magic bullcrap they have is one hell of an advantage. Getting some kind of augment integration with the Kishman wizards just took on a whole new priority. And so did figuring out whether or not we can play with magic. Are the Berkeley boys ready? The art of Weiser, my marines adopted, cleared medical, and we sent him to Earthside yesterday for more scans after he volunteered to share his medical data. Yeah, I saw your brief on that, and I'll get on the horn with Berkeley and make sure that they step up the pace. When is the wizard team supposed to show up? They're selecting their artificers now. They're supposed to arrive Tuesday. Good. Get them sorted and start training hard. A new crapstorm is going to have us on lockdown for a bit, but General Langston's offensive and aggressive enough as it is. Once we're sure our balls are covered, there's going to be a huge demand for Hull to pay. No doubt, sir. He looked at the aides, answered another call. I've got to go deal with this frick show. Your boys did good the other day, but their job is not done. Make sure they're squared away and ready to rumble come Tuesday. We've got a lot to work to do. Aye, sir. Man, this freaking sucks, Gomez groaned, banging on the back of his head on the Tesco wall that he sat against. I know, man, Kowalski said. The freaking lockdown bullcrap is really cutting into our profit margin. Of course, our chief complaint is not being able to scam and other marines out of their hard-earned pay. Bradford rolled her eyes. It ain't no scam, he said. It's free enterprise. Can you even spell free enterprise? I don't need to spell it if it's making me money. Bradford snorted, shaking her head. I'm not going to dignify that with a response. I'm just sick of being on watch or on patrol, Edison said. What are they trying to do? Hope that we just stumble onto an invisible bastard's by chance. We just had 18 hours of liberty back on Earth, Dubois said, rolling his eyes. We don't get to complain about anything. Edison snorted. I am a Marine. I can complain about everything. Yeah, well, I'd like to complain about your mom, Gomez said. Hey, my mother is a nice lady. She works very hard every night at Goldfingers. Kimber laughed. I'm sure Kowalski was her favorite customer then. Kowalski is every stripper's favorite customer, Bradford said, rolling her eyes. Rin perked up his ears in the discussion, but opted not to join in the conversation. It was the most that he had moved since he had flopped down against the wall. Serious, though, this is freaking sucks, Davies shook his head. How are we supposed to catch the bastards if they can turn freaking invisible? Alvin Commandos, man, Stephen said, staring across the cleared field to the other side of the wall into the trees beyond. Freaking elven commandos pulled some legless bullcrap. Did anyone get the guys who died? Dewar asked. Nah, Kimber said. They were all from the 3rd Battalion. Think Samson might have fricked one of them, Kowalski said. You think Samson might have fricked everyone? Bradford gave him a sideways glance. He might have. Ugh. Bradford rolled her eyes again. <clears throat> Rin moaned. He waved a hand in the direction. Bradford laughed. What's the matter, Shields? She squatted next to him and poked him in the side, looking like a ticklish spot. Party a little too hard last night. Groaning, he tucked his arm in and leaned away from her, trying to protect his side. Instead, he slid along the wall until he fell over. Bradford squatted down and poked him some more. Come on, Shields. How are you going to keep your staff going if you'd pass out? We don't have anything else that we can see invisible keeblers. He groaned, coning up into a ball. Doesn't need me set to auto magic. Bradford blinked, snorted a laugh. Is that, is that a freaking word now? 
The distraction was her undoing. She failed to notice Ren slipping his tail into one of her straps around her pack until the sharp tug threw her off balance in a squat and she found herself on her rear. She blinked in surprise and then joined the rest of the squad in laughter. You sneaky bastard! Rin flicked his tail up to press against the, her mouth. Shh. She swatted his tail away as they all laughed again. Heads up, here comes trouble, Dubois said, nodding towards the Humvee barreling the way. It's no time for our relief yet, is it? Davy said. Nope, Miller said. Come on, Shields, time to put your armor back on. Bradford poked him in the side again. Rin groaned but sat up and dragged the plate carrier over. Bradford helped him put it on and then hauled him to his feet. I can barely move in this thing. How can you stand to run in it? Lots of PT, Gomez said. And knee problems, Kimber added. Yeah, Kowalski grumbled. I figured I'd have enough joint damage by the time I get out. I'll be making E5 for life. Further, conversation was forestalled by the Humvee as it roared up and groaned to a halt with a squeal of the brakes. The doors swung open and Lieutenant Mayers and Staff Sergeant Rickles stepped out. A pair of MPs stepped out behind them, followed by two dogs and their handlers as they squeezed into the back. Second artificer Ayat, Myers said, stepping up to the squad. You are to come with us to questioning. Rex and Lucy will cover your sector. What kind of questioning, sir? Kowalski said, immediately on edge. The rest of the squad fell in behind Bradford and she saw Kimber and Samson put themselves between Rin and the lieutenant. The technical kind, Rickles said, giving them a small, calming wave. He's more valuable for his expertise than a sentry right now. The squad relaxed a bit, though Kowalski still gave the MPs a suspicious eye. I'd still like to come along, sir, Bradford said, stepping forward. He falls under my command. If you're going to be questioning him, I should be there. She paused and then added a thought occurred to her. You might also need someone to translate. Mayers gave her a considering look and then nodded. Very well, pile in. Aye, sir, she said and glanced at her shoulder. Dubois, you're in charge until I get back. Aye, sergeant. She caught Davis's frown as she turned back towards the lieutenant and G and Run followed him into the UNV. Technically, Davies is more senior, but uh, if he wanted to maintain seniority, he shouldn't have gone sick boy commando. Bradford put this concern out of her mind as Run passed her with his staff and climbed into the back of the Humvee after her. He groaned as he settled himself into a position and had passing resemblance to comfortable. She grinned and tapped him on the arm, leaning over to whisper in his ear. Hey, they sent two dog teams to replace you, and you were mostly passed out and hung over. Ren snorted, taking out his staff back and curling up as he was leaning against the bulkhead. He smirked like he was going to give her a smart remark, but the Humphy jolted, bounced his head off the bulkhead, and he whimpered and groaned instead. At ease, Sergeant, a tall, lanky, naval intelligence shut the door behind him. I am Lieutenant Borber, Office of Naval Intelligence. He shifted a folder and a notebook in his left hand and offered a handshake as Bradford introduced herself and Rin. To be clear, Sergeant, Second Artificer, nobody's in trouble, but we are at desperate need of information, technical and non-technical, and there are a few people in a better position to provide that than yourself. He added to Rin. I will share what I can, sir, Wren said, standing almost at attention, just to keep himself from swaying. Bradford repeated the words for Borders' benefit. Excellent, Borders said, dropping this folder and notebook down onto the table and sitting across from Bradford and Wren. Let's start with invisibility. Bradford glanced around the room as she and Wren returned to their seats. They had barely been sitting for more than a minute before Lieutenant had arrived, more than an unfinished closet than interrogation room vibe, but... It's not far off. Border opened the folder and flipped to a blank page in his notebook. Clicking his pen a few times, he found the starting point in the paper and folder. And we understand that they have two versions of it. Is this correct? Yes, Red nodded. Bradford continued the translation. They have the blending and true invisibility. Can you elaborate on blending? Yes. He took a moment to collect his thoughts. His ears drooped, and Bradford could tell that his movements were slower and more deliberate than usual. But he was putting on a strong front. Blending is a, a blending of their appearance with their surroundings. Light does not pass through them, but they create an appearance that it does. He paused to allow Bradford to translate, and she got the feeling that he was using a break to piece more words together. Border nodded, jotting the abbreviated version down on a notepad. Is his effect biological? Is it their skin changing? He added in response to Rin's uncertain look. Some of our expressions translate really well, Bradford thought. 
No, Rin started to shake his head, then immediately thought of it better as, uh, it is an illusion they create that covers anything that they are wearing or holding. It sounds like active camouflage, sir, Bradford added at the end of the translation. Indeed, the lieutenant nodded as he looked back to Rin. What are the advantages, the limitations, and how good of an illusion is it? The quality of the blend can vary from elf to the next, but they can't perfectly recreate what is behind them, and even the best can't see in close range and observant watcher. He paused for another translation. So far as we can tell, it requires more energy to maintain than an elf can sustain indefinitely, but it is relatively light draw on their reserves. Rapid ships in background or in lighting can give them away. Border looked up from the notes. Is this a... Uh, he glanced at another sheets of notes, an artifice that the Kishman can create. No. Rin slowly shook his head. We have tried, and there have been experiments, but uh, the spell structure is incredibly refined and complex. We can create illusions, but not to nearly the same detail or precision, not that conform to so completely. And what about true invisibility? Border asked, jotting a note down and flipping the fresh page. True invisibility is just that. They are truly invisible. Light passes right through them. Border nodded. Yes, we have limited data, but between the various vehicle-mounted sensors in the first battle, the security sensors and around FOB Williams, it seems that their invisibility covers not just a visible light spectrum, but also IR and near UV. Do you know if their invisibility covers the EM spectrum, or just parts of it? Ren frowned and slowly cocked his head to the side. I do not know what you speak of. Bradford turned to him and translated his confusion. All light is made up of what we call photons, unimaginably tiny book particles that move incredibly fast. That sounds like the spec theory of light. It proposes that light is made up of individual specks rather than waves and in the ether, which is accepted as understanding. Well, it's, um, both technically, except that there's neither. E. Bradford smiled at his confusion and deepened. We can discuss the peculiarities of wave particle duality another time, Border said. The important part is that photons have a frequency and the colors we see and whether we see them depend on the frequency. Above visible light is ultraviolet light, then x-rays and gamma rays. Below visible light is infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Rin shook his head. I am not the most scholarly Kishman, but I attended a university at Yagihane, one of the most highly regarded universities in the kingdom. Nobody spoke of light as anything but what you could see. I see, Border said, writing in his notebook. And what are the limitations on true invisibility? Energy. Rin said, it is much more energy intensive spell, and we have never seen them maintain it for any great length of time, hours at most. Border nodded, writing more notes. And can Kishman create anything similar? Rin slowly shook his head. No. The sophistication of the spell, it's, it's much harder to glean from observation. Articulating the spell should be possible, but the design is so intricate and refined, even what fragments we have been able to capture. He placed a hand on the side of his head. Not that we haven't tried. There have been experiments using recorded fragments of spells and attempting to fill in the blanks, but none of them determined anything, he snorted. I remember Professor Simeon complaining of a storm of some of them and how they were causing resonance interference with the crystal experiments that he was trying to perform. Bradford tilted her head and translated the last comment. Was the experiment on mana crystals? No. Marin said, massaging his skull just forward at the base of his ears. It was a Jigalania crystals. They are very poor mana capacitors, barely even count for it, but abundant enough. Professor Simeon wanted to see if there was a way to make them more useful. He sighed as his unpleasant memory. He would rave at length about mana capacitors so cheap and abundant that they could replace raw mana crystals as a storage medium. He slid his hand up and rubbed the base of his right horn. Nothing ever came from his experiments. He insisted that he was because the invisibility experiments, that they were causing resonance in the crystal arrays, disrupting his experiments, even though no mana connection was ever identified. He snorted again. Simeon was always a crazy old coot. Maybe not, Border said, exchanging a glance with Bradford. Rin crocked and neared at Tim. Your professor might have made an early crystal radio set. Rin turned in ear to her. Not my area of expertise, she laughed, holding up a hand before glancing at Border. But sir, if he had... The lieutenant nodded. Yes, this could be important. We'll definitely look into it. He jotted down another note and then flipped to a clean page. For now, though, there are more questions. 
Bradford heard Rin suppress a whine, but had sat straight as questions dragged on. Let's talk about the elves themselves. What are their physical capabilities? They are fast and agile and have significant strength in short bursts. How fast can an elf run? Faster than a Kishman in a sprint, slower over any considerable distance unless they have magical support. How fast can a Kishman run? In a sprint, a hundred tails in ten to twelve seconds without armor. How long a distance? Maybe seven or eight royal miles in an hour for a few hours. A properly equipped soldier can march eight or nine royal miles in a day. Fifteen, maybe twenty with a long forced march. How long can an elf run for? Without mana supplementation, only for a few minutes at speed, maybe for an hour at a jog, with mana supplementation for as long as they have mana reserves. What do you mean by mana supplementation? Elves can sustain themselves and starve off exhaustion by bolstering themselves with external mana supplies. Interesting. Do you know how often or how much they need to eat? Can they replace their need to eat? Elven armies are at least partly sustained by magic, and it is believed that the elves can sustain themselves exclusively on mana for a time, he sighed, continuing to mar Sarge's skull. I don't know the details of elven dietary habits. They only eat plants and look down on us for eating flesh. Border snorted. Sounds like a few humans I know, he muttered, shaking his head. What kind of magical abilities do they have? Do all elves have magic? Ren nodded. All known elves have magical abilities and draw mana from the Aether. This was known for long before the war, when the elves were merely isolationists. What about your people? Only some Kishmen do, he frowned. Estimates vary, but generally accepted figure is between 10 and 15% of all Kishmen can touch the Aether. Only about half of those are with a potent enough to be useful in combat. How do elven magical abilities compare to Kishmen? Run sighed. Elven magical abilities exceed Kishman abilities on the whole. Elves naturally draw more mana from the Aether, enough to power noteworthy offensive and defensive spells, and they have significant natural mana reserves. His hand was on the back rubbing his skull, between the base of his horn and his brow. Kishman savants can exceed most elven abilities, but even the greatest savant is limited by roughly the same ambient draw cap as the other Kishman, and can't match an elf for power output without external mana sources. You mean mana crystals? Yes. And where do mana crystals come from? Elves and Kishman can both draw mana from the Aether and condense it into crystals, reducing new crystals or growing existing crystals. Elves can condense mana into crystals to form at a rate of at least two to three times greater than that of a Kishman. Is this where all mana crystals come from? Ren slowly shook his head. No. Most mana crystals are used by the Kishman on mind. We're not sure what causes their formation. He added, anticipating Border's next question. What about the elves? Rin frowned, staring through the table. Elves can use mage towers and other means to drain people of life force. He rolled his ears and tugged at his horn. At least that's what was thought to happen when the magics were used. Border raised an eyebrow. Bradford suppressed a shudder at the memory of the Kishman chained to the mage tower. A uh, more modern understanding, Rin said, deliberately placing his hand back on the table is that such magic employs the process that forces them to draw ethereal mana at an accelerated rate, while also force converting the body's natural energy stores into mana, possibly to power the process. He paused, his ears flicked down. The full details are not known. Such magics are outlawed across the kingdom centuries before they consolidated under Granlin. We didn't know the elves even practiced such magic until the war. Bradford felt a sinking feeling in her stomach as she relayed the translation, only made worse by Bower's next question. What do they use for such magic for? The elves use the process to turn people into living batteries to directly power artifices. He paused, his ears breaking back to his skull. It is also possible, in theory, to create mana crystals in this way. We have never observed it, but there is no mechanical reason why they couldn't. Bradford's stomach felt like she wanted to turn it inside out. Border sat back in shock for a moment, but pressed it forward. All those crystals were captured at the elven camp. Ren nodded, his hand moving back to slowly massage his skull. It is suspected that a significant portion of mana crystals used by the elves come from Kishman prisoners. But if, uh, Bradford's stomach dropped through her chair as she made another realization, they're freaking vampires. Ren flicked a confused ear at her, tilting her head and glancing at her. 
They can live off mana, and they suck people dry of it, she snarled. Horror and rage battling for dominance, they turn people into mana and eat them. Yes, that is. His ears drooped, and he nodded. We believe that is so. Border took a moment to recompose himself. He jotted several notes down, then flipped to a clean page. Can an individual elf boost its endurance, or does that take a group of more sophisticated equipment than an individual can carry? No, it is something that all elves can do, Rin shrugged his ears. Our understanding is that it works in the same way that Kishman artificer would draw on mana, but they are able to apply it to themselves in a way that we are not. He firmly shook his head and immediately grimaced in regret. Ugh. Not even the worst dark artifices in legend and lore were able to sustain themselves with mana like that. How much mana would a single elf go through to sustain a heavy activity for a day? I'm not sure. Best guess? Rin frowned, concentrating. The elven armies, they, um, they maneuver with an economy of endurance. He rubbed his other side of his face. They luxuriate in the abundance of mana, but they still conserve their maneuvers. I think it takes a lot of mana for them to supplement their natural endurance. How long do you think a single elf can sustain himself with just what he can carry on his person? How rapidly would he be depleted? Bradford narrowed her eyes and pointed questions suddenly becoming very suspicious. I don't know, Run carefully shook his head. I'm a shield artificer, not a physician or a naturalist. One of them got through, didn't they, sir? Rin's ears poked up, lagging for only a fraction of a second. I'm not at liberty to answer that question, Sergeant. You don't have to say anything, sir. It's freaking obvious just by your questions. I can help. Rin slid his chair back and pushed himself to his feet. Can you pinpoint the elf's exact location? Border looked up at him, his pen still holding over his notepad. No. Can you track an elf from miles away? No. Then I'm not sure that you can actually be of much help. Rin sighed, sitting back down, his ears drooping. Border eyed him for a moment and then set his pen down and notepad and leaned forward. You've already helped a lot. We're lacking for intel more than anything else right now. He sat back with a shake of his head, picking his pen up and absently twirling it on his fingers. There's a countrywide manhunt drawing resources from across the state. We've got dogs on the trail and county sheriffs haven't asked for military help. Wren raised a right ear, quirking it in confusion. Rules and laws, Bradford said, resisting the urge to ruffle his ears. The military is kept strictly separate from law enforcement and civil matters. Things tend to get messy when the military are also the police. Rin started opening his mouth like he wanted to ask more, but closed it again when Border leaned forward and continued. Right now, we need more intel than anything. Anything you can tell us about the capabilities, vulnerabilities, equipment, armor, anything. Right. Rin scrunched up his eyes, shut for a moment, refocusing himself. Armor. He took a deep breath. Alvin armor is light and thin, but heavily enchanted. It is laced and embossed with gold and platinum to help hold enchantments. What is it made of, mostly? It is made of steel, but barely thick enough to be able to rigid on its own without enchantments. Most of it is the strength comes from enchantments. They make it strong enough to turn and deflect any regular blade if it doesn't find a gap. Is Krishman armor the same? The advantages could be given to us are obvious, Bradford thought. Rin shook his head. Gandan armor is rarely so enchanted, making such armor is certainly within the capabilities of a decent artificer. But the royal host's lord generals typically do not deem it worth the cost in time, materials, and manner, at least for the common soldiers. We mainly rely on bolstering our arms and armor with active enchantments provided by battlefield artificers like myself. Is there anything that you can do for us? Bradford asked, heading off the lieutenant's next question. Yes, Rin nodded. Active shields are my specialty, but all field artificers are trained to bolster their lines and columns with active enchantments. How does this active enchantment compare to the elves' fixed enchantment? Favorably enough, if we have the mana to support it, even bolstered by active artificer support, our weapons often struggle to penetrate armor worn by elven regulars, but they have the same problem with our armor that is properly reinforced, he frowned, except for gem blades. Gem blades? They're out of an elite regiment. They have even further enchanted armor and mana gem powered blades that can cut through even artificer enhanced Kishman armor. Combat reports noted that some elves had shields while others did not. Yes, Rin slowly bobbed his head. Elves trained as mages with mana gem powered stars can protect personal shields in addition to general shield work and offensive spell casting. He paused for a moment and then nodded. 
Senior Alvia and regulars sometimes have devices that project weaker shields. You've mentioned mana gems twice now. Is that another term for a mana crystal? No, Rin shook his head. Mana gems are made of condensed mana, like a mana crystal, but they have a much more intricate and complex structure. They are very difficult and somewhat dangerous to make, very specialized. How so? Gem blade mana gems can't be turned into staff mana gems and vice versa. They're also tuned specifically to the creator elf, and not easily used by even other elves, let alone non-elves. We haven't figured out how to make them either, he added. So an elf can either be a gem blade or a wizard, not both. Not that I've ever heard of, he tugged at his ear. I suppose it is possible, but we've never seen it. He released his ear, rolling them both in a rug. There wasn't a whole lot known about the elves before the war, but one thing we did know was that they held their mana gems very precious and dear, because it was an arduous and dangerous process to create them and many elves never even undertook. Border's pocket buzzed his three short pulses, interrupting his next question before he could ask it. He pulled out his phone, swiping on the screen to check the message. That's enough questions for now. You'll have plenty more tomorrow on the lab, he said, putting his phone back in his pocket and collecting his notes. He stood up and he left the room with barely a glance at either of them. Ren heaved a sigh of relief, sagging in on himself as Lieutenant left. Damn, he looks so miserable, Gradford glanced at her watch. At least it's past time that we were supposed to be relieved. Bradford looked over at Rin at his Humvee turned down the street. It's five minute ride and he is already asleep. She shook her head. Not that any of us are going to be much better after getting racked at 0300. She glanced back over at him, smiling as the ear twitched in his sleep. He's freaking adorable, she smirked as she considered startling him awake, but dismissed the idea. I don't have the heart for it. Leaning over, gently tapping on his shoulder instead. Hey, shields, we're home. Hmm? He said, lifting his head up and barely looking around, his ears rolled. He swiveled forward and back twice before setting a droopy version of his normal rearward sweep. That's the third time I've seen his ears do that when he wakes up, she chuckled softly. He's got a boot-up sequence. The Humvee jerked to a stop and squealed Bob brakes. Bradford tapped the back of the driver's seat and before hopping out. Thanks for the lift, Mac. Any chime, Jabs? Corporal Mackenzie held her hand in her window and fist bumped. Just don't forget the beer that you owe me. Next time we're out not in a wall zone, I promise. She waved her friend and rounded out the other side of the Humvee as Rin finished the slower exit. Is the day over yet? He asked as the Humvee pulled away. Afraid not, Shields, Dubois said, stepping out from the squad's tent to meet them. Sergeant, he nodded in greeting. Words just came down from HQ. They're mustering up a whole battalion to start putting up a buildings and slapping together a training course for this joint tactical development project. The rest of the squad started trudging out of the tent. Their spirits lifted slightly to see shields returned unharmed. Our company's been tasked with putting up prefabs. Bradford sighed as a small train of trucks rolled up. Of course we have. All right, devil dogs, First Sergeant Catry shouted, standing at the bed of the first uncovered truck, looking over the cab. Mount up, barracks and classrooms ain't gonna build themselves. Cutting into my profits, Kowalski muttered as he trudged past Bradford. Rin sagged and wearily fell in behind him, climbing into the back of the truck with the marines. She gave him a sympathetic look and climbed in beside him. Freaking pog work, Davies grumbled, trudging up the wall behind the rest of the squad. He grunted as he heaved himself into the truck. We already spent six hours on watch and after four hours on alert. Can't they find someone else to this? Say again, your last marine, Catry shouted, fixing Davies in his sights. Is an honest day's work not good enough for you? No, first sergeant, Davies shouted, sitting up at attention. Catry eyed Davis for a moment before rounding on Bradford. Sergeant Bradford, I find your squad's lack of enthusiasm to be unsatisfactory. If you do not correct this issue, I will assign you to the task of more motivation. Is that understood, Sergeant Bradford? Yes, first sergeant. Bradford snapped out at a response. She resisted the urge to glare at Davies. He still doesn't know when to keep his freaking mouth shut. Just think about it, though, Edison said, sitting down in the frame he was carrying and bracing it while Kimba walked it upright. What would you do if you had two schlongs? Two schlongs, Kimba asked, giving him a look through the frame. Yeah, like two whole schlongs, Edison vaguely pointed over his shoulder. There's a no-crapper guy who was born with two genetic mutations that gave him two whole, fully functional schlongs. Two 
fully functional schlongs, Samson asked her of a handful of screws that he held in his mouth. He started running them onto the frame which the screw gun, securing the previous section of the wall. I'm telling you, the possibilities are endless, Edison grinned. Are we talking side by side or one over the other? Kimber asked. Side by side, Edison said. The guy is in an article had them right next to the other. Bruh, do they like both work or is, is like one, one on service and the other off duty? They both work together, dude. I'm telling you, the possibilities are endless. Are we really having this conversation? Bradford asked, parking a fresh wheelbarrow full of joint compound next to the slowly forming wall. Hey, I bet you could go male porn star and completely skip the gay porn stage, Kimber said. Oh, frick yeah, Kowalski said, stepping away from the wall and walking over to the stack of drywall to retrieve another sheet. Instant porn star status. I guess we are, she said, rolling her eyes as she grabbed a hawk and knife from the wheelbarrow and started fitting the joints. Rin, slowly pushing himself up from where he had been sitting against the wall, waiting for her return. You'd be a superstar until the novelty ran out, Dubois said, grabbing another handful of screws from the tub as he's sharing with Samson. Yeah, but then you could just cash out and retire, Kimber said, grabbing another frame and set up with Edison. True, Dubois said. About you, Jabs, Davies asked, leaning against the pallet of gypsum bags, waiting to mix another batch of joint compound. What would you do if a guy offered to give you a double-barreled dicking? I'd tell him he'd be a better fit in your rear, she said without looking up as she scooped another lump of mud out to her board. Oh, snap, Samson said as the rest of the squad jeered at Davies. But, uh, real talk, Jabs, Kowalski said, would you frick a guy with two schlongs? She laughed, shaking her head. I don't know, seems like double the work, and he probably still wouldn't be able to make me happy. I always leave my girls happy, Davy smirked. Your hands don't count, Miller said, poking his head over the wall as he and Stephen screwed in the next rafter. Oh, Miller from the left field, Samson grinned, snagging another handful of screws. The squad ragged on Davies for his lack of girlfriend for a moment before Edison dragged the conversation back to the double schlonged man. You're awfully obsessed with these double schlongs for a straight guy, Samson said, giving Edison a sly look. You sure you're not interested in a little of your own action? What? No, it's just, uh, he sputtered as the rest of the squad laughed at him. I want two schlongs. What's wrong with wanting two schlongs? Hey, I'll give you two schlongs any time you want, Kowalski said, slapping Edison in the ass as he passed by. Man, frack off. Bradford shook her head laughing as she finished the second sheet of drywall. She stepped over and helped Rin finish the first as the squad continued to discuss the virtues of a double-schlonged man. Are Kishman's shoulders this bad, she asked. Hmm? He asked, rolling a drooped ear and focus on her. Never mind, she said, dropping a board and knife back into the wheelbarrow while she waited for more drywall and framing to go up. Okay, he muttered, leaning against the newly erected wall. Bradford shook her head and stepped away from the squad's project to survey the rest of the battalion's efforts. A veritable city had been erected before her. Dozens of new buildings were going up. Several already had marines holding tables and chairs and desks and cots inside. Others were busy shoveling out gravel to make our street, and Bradford was almost certain that she could already hear a gunny somewhere yelling at marines to keep off the grass. Beyond the micro city, the whole new obstacle course was going up, and beyond that, Bulldozers were piling up berms and there was supposed to be a new firing range. More marines were building Hesco walls to enclose the entire compound. Are they going to have the whole battalion training here? She wondered. Why didn't they just leave them at Williams? She shook her head, deciding it was best not to try and understand the mysterious reasoning of the top brass, and turned back just in time to see Rin draining the last of the bang down his throat. Rin, no, she shouted, racing over to snatch the can. Don't give him that. Are you crazy? She was too late. The can was empty. Man, he was dragging his ass, Kowalski said. We don't know what it would do to him. She looked at the empty can. Crap, this is extra strength kind too. Yeah, that's all I bought, Kowalski shrugged. What's wrong? Rin asked. I feel fine. It was, um, sweet, tangy, and fizzy. And it made my nose tingle. I feel fine. His ear twitched. In fact, I feel more awake. Bradford eyed him up and down, then sighed, crumpling the can and tossing it to Kowalski. Just keep an eye on him. We don't want his heart to explode. Ren's ears poked up and the tip of his left twitched slightly. I think you're exaggerating. I feel really good now. A few minutes later, 
I can feel the sky. Rin spun in circles, arms raised above his head while standing on a stack of drywall. I think I might have frecked up, Kowalski said, staring at him, along with the rest of the squad. You think? Bradford asked. I have so much energy. He stopped spinning, his eyes wide and ears straight up, the left one twitching regularly. He stretched his hands out before him and shot sparks of magic from his hands. <laughs> he cackled. I have unlimited power. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you turned him into a freaking Palpatine. Um, my bad? Bradford sighed, rubbing a hand across her face. I thought I'd already seen a long day. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.